creative theoretical work in astrophysics. In fact, something of a watershed appears to have been reached in the year 2003. In that year, three scientists, Arvind Bord, Alexander Vilenkin, and Alan Guth, were able to prove that any universe, which is on average expanding throughout its history, cannot be infinite in the past, but must have a past space-time boundary. And what makes their proof so powerful is that it holds independently of any physical description of the early universe. Because we can't yet provide a physical description of the very early universe, this has been fertile ground for speculations. This early region has been compared by some scientists to the regions on ancient maps labeled here there be dragons. Uh, it can be just filled with all sorts of fantasies. But the bord guth vilenkin theorem is independent of any physical description of that early beginning of the universe. Their theorem implies that even if the universe is just part of a wider multiverse of many universes, even then the multiverse itself must have an absolute beginning. Vilenkin is blunt about the implications. I quote, it is said that an argument is what convinces reasonable men and a proof is what it takes to convince even an unreasonable man. With the proof now in place, cosmologists can no longer hide behind the possibility of a past eternal universe. There is no escape. They have to face the problem of a cosmic beginning. Now we can fully expect that new theories of the universe will be proposed attempting to avoid the universe's absolute beginning. Such proposals are to be welcomed. And we have no reason to expect that they'll be any more successful in averting the absolute beginning of the universe than their failed predecessors. Now, of course, scientific results are always provisional. Nevertheless, I think it seems pretty clear in this case which way the evidence points. Today, the proponent of Al-Ghazali's argument stands solidly within mainstream science in accepting that the universe began to exist. On the basis then of both philosophical argument and scientific evidence, I think we have good grounds for believing the second premise of Al-Ghazali's argument that the universe began to exist. But that takes us back to the first premise of Ghazali's argument, that whatever begins to exist has a cause. I think that this principle, that whatever begins to exist has a cause, is so obvious that it is virtually undeniable for any sincere seeker after truth. For something to begin to exist without any cause of any sort would be to come into being from nothing. And that is surely impossible. Let me give three reasons in support of this premise. First, something cannot come from nothing. To claim that something can come into being from nothing is literally worse than magic. I mean, think about it. When the magician pulls a rabbit out of the hat, at least you've got the magician, not to speak of the hat. But if you deny this premise, then you've got to think that the whole universe just appeared at some point in the finite past for no reason whatsoever. But nobody sincerely believes that things, say a horse or an Eskimo village, could just pop into being uncaused out of nothing. Nobody here this morning is worried that while you're listening to this lecture, a horse may have popped into being uncaused back in your living room right now and is there defiling the carpet as we speak. <laughs> now, sometimes skeptics will respond to this argument that by saying that in modern physics, subatomic particles, so-called virtual particles, 
uh, can come into being from nothing. Or again, certain theories of the origin of the universe have been touted as showing that you can get something from nothing because the universe comes into being out of the vacuum. So that the universe is the exception to the proverb, there ain't no free lunch. Now this skeptical response represents a deliberate abuse of science. The theories in question have to do with particles or the universes uh, coming into being as a fluctuation of the energy contained in the vacuum. And the vacuum in physics is not what the layman means by vacuum, uh, nothing. Rather for physics, the vacuum is a sea of fluctuating energy, a scene of violent physical activity, having a physical structure and governed by physical laws. To tell lay people that on such theories something comes into being from nothing is a deliberate distortion of those theories. Properly understood, nothing does not mean just empty space. Rather, nothing is the absence of anything whatsoever, even the absence of empty space. And as such, nothingness literally has no properties at all because there isn't anything to have any properties. So how silly it is when popularizers say things like nothingness is unstable to vacuum fluctuations or the universe tunneled into being out of nothingness. Secondly, if something can come into being from nothing, then it becomes inexplicable why just anything or everything doesn't come into being from nothing. Think about it. Why don't bicycles or Beethoven or root beer just pop into being uncaused out of nothing? There can't be anything about nothingness that favors universes because nothingness has no properties. So what makes nothingness so discriminatory that only universes can pop into being <laughs> from nothingness? Nothing cannot be constrained by anything either because there's nothing to be constrained. Now, at this point, the atheist is likely to retort, okay, then what is God's cause if everything has to have a cause? I'm always amazed at the self-congratulatory attitude of people who pose this question. They've imagined that they've said something really profound or important here when all they've done is simply misunderstand the premise. Premise one does not say that everything has a cause. It says everything that begins to exist has a cause. Something that is eternal and never began to exist wouldn't have a cause. And so Al-Ghazali would say that God is simply eternal and uncaused. And notice this isn't special pleading for God because this is what the atheist has always said about the universe. The universe is eternal and uncaused. The only problem is we now have good evidence that the universe is not eternal in the past, but had an absolute beginning. And therefore the atheist is backed into the corner of having to affirm that for no reason whatsoever, the universe just popped into being uncaused out of absolutely nothing, which is absurd. Thirdly, common experience and scientific evidence confirm the truth of premise one. Premise one is constantly verified and never falsified. It's hard to understand how any atheist committed to the truth of modern science could deny in light of the evidence that premise one is plausibly true. So I think that the first premise of Al-Ghazali's argument is clearly true.